regions, basically one school from each um, constituency, and it's quite a variety. So um, we have very good schools there, we have very bad schools there, um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an overview right now. Um, there are a couple of partners, at first it's the Polytechnic, that's the academic side of it, the Polytechnic of Namibia, that's where I'm working. Then we have a community training center that was always existent, but, uh, but didn't really know what to do, kind of funded by the Ministry of Youth in Namibia. They are, they are, they are the Ognongo Technology Center, they are based in Gobabis. They are basically our partner when it goes to reaching people and asking for where can we sleep when we go to this particular village and those kind of things. Then we have Telecom which sponsors us. Then we have, oh yeah, they are also supposed to put internet access there, but I'll come back to that. Then we have government input, direct with the education in Omaheke, and then we have those six pilot schools. Um, I've listed a few of, oh, I've listed them here, I'm not going to go through the list. Uh, let me say that it has a huge variety. We have we have a primary school, we have a senior secondary school, uh, so up to grade 12. We have uh, most of them are junior secondary schools. All of them at different places. Um, we have visited them all. We have noted down the, the technical requirements. All of them have a computer lab, and all of them got their computer lab by the following means. Uh, there was a government uh, initiative to, to say, well, we need to increase literacy in Namibia, so the first thing that we need to do is the schools need to get computers. So, in drove a truck from Wintuk, offloaded 20 computers, the technician was plugging them all together, switching them up, checking that it works, and then they left. Um, and as a result, all, uh, all schools, Oh yeah, no, one doesn't have a real computer lab, but I'll come back to that. Uh, all schools pretty much uh, have one room less now, because they have one new classroom which is taken up by computers that nobody uses. Um, we have, we have uh, okay, outstanding here is Mokaneli Clavanello in, in, in Dremiopsis. Dremiopsis is one of those settlements where there's still no Wikipedia article because there's not a single reliable source of the internet. Uh, <laughs> I, I have yet to find something in the community library or something. It is the worst secondary school in entire Namibia, pass rate 8.4% for grade 10 and 5.1% and for, for grade 12. Um, that's a depressing place. Because what they've been doing is, uh, they've given up on the school. Um, every teacher who cannot be reformed particularly the role of the can speaking thing, uh, people. You know, every teacher who cannot be reformed is posted to Montanetti Flavanello. Um, every pupil who can't get a place anywhere else is sent there. So you have, you have like 15 teachers uh, that want to be left alone. You have 500 senior secondary students that know that this is the last educational institution they see in their lives. Uh, because there's no exit from, from Clavanello, at least not upwards, just downwards. So that's very really depressing. Um, we also have the best school, we have the best primary school in Donko Boss. Uh, Donko Boss is, is as fascinating a place as the name indicates, uh, means dark bush. Um, if you want to go there, there's a, there's a 40 kilometer long sand track, uh, which is knee deep. Uh, so there's, yes, there is a way to go there without 4x4. We tried it once, we pushed the Siaya um, all the way to Donkabos, with the result that the car was a write-off afterwards, complete write-off. So, um, so it's hard to get there, it's expensive to get there, because we haven't got always access to a 4x4. Uh, if we are going there, we are going there with six or seven people, which means we essentially need a Unimog to, to, to load all the, all the baggage and stuff. But it is a fantastic school actually, because at first it's a, it's a school predominantly for the San, obviously known as the Bushmen, but in Namibia I learned we don't say 
or I know that we don't say Bushman, I've learned that in Botswana it's the other way around somehow. The, the saying sound is not so nice. So, but I do it in Namibia anyway. Um, and people are fighting for that school. There's nothing. There's no land line in the entire settlement. There's no electricity. There's no water. Uh, there's no road leading to it, or what you would call a road. Uh, and it's a marginalized community, uh, still marginalized in independent Namibia. So several NGOs are fighting for that school to, you know, to, to be the main sponsor and to direct in which the, uh, where it should go, which sometimes doesn't make it easier. We have been there only once so far, as you can see, only one uh, visit. Uh, and we haven't gotten any further because we always, you know, we always have to push the others out of the way because they say, no, we do it like this, and other than there's UNESCO coming, and there's the German, German development aid coming, then there's some other partner coming, everybody wants something else with the result that nothing happens. Um, yeah, we have, uh, I've, I've introduced the challenges already, but you see, uh, we have talismanus, likewise, with other Wikipedia entry, because there's no reliable sources for it. Uh, I can vouch that the settlement exists, I've been there. Um, they have paid up internet, it goes all the way to the router in the lab, and we haven't got the passwords. Somehow it belongs to a Mayaka region, but educationally it belongs to the surgery, so that so that the director of education in Omaheke is not responsible for that, and Telecom is not responsible for the connection, and we haven't found the guy with the password. So those are the things that we struggle with. Uh, just to give you some visual ideas, that is the main road in Talismanus. Uh, it is actually the village center, so, so there's not much more than that. It's, it's, it's the pictures taken right out of the school onto the main road. Um, so there's no bed and breakfast there. <laughs> uh, obviously no lodge, no shop, no bar. Oh yeah, there are bars, but you don't know about that. Um, another visual, it looks almost the same, just the sand is of a different color, that is Donkobos, the primary school. You see the only piece of infrastructure right in the picture, that is the water tower. So the entire two settlements, it's, it's, it's Sonne Bloom and Donkobos, they share this school. Um, and all three entities, the two settlements and the school, have one piece of infrastructure, that's this water tower, which ends up in the community water tank. So that was it. In, in Dongabos, you don't even get the BNB, which is, which is phenomenal for Namibia because we actually get anywhere. Uh, people can at least drink, you know. Um, one more. Oh, yeah, let me show you. Let me show you how people stay there. I don't know how nicely visible that is. That's the boys' hostel. Um, so the, there are a few mattresses, they are badly soiled. This is actually a room for 40 male students. Uh, so which means there's always four sleeping on a mattress rectangular. Uh, so so not one kid, one mattress, but they sleep like that. Uh, there's no glass in the windows. Uh, there's no paint on the wall. You can see it's a concrete floor. Um, it's dirty, it's ice cold in winter, it's, it's, it's burning hot in summer, it's in the middle of the Kalahari. So this is what, this, these are the living conditions that we are talking about. Um, it's the best primary school in Omaha. <coughs> but they're cheating a little bit because you see, uh, a Sahn community member doesn't want to move away from their community. Actually, they can't do that and they have no secondary school and Namibia has 10 years of compulsory school attendance which means all those who make it through grade 7, instead of going through grade 8, grade 8 they go through grade 7 again. Uh, and another time, and another time. And what they measure, if they measure best primary school, is they, made, they measure the results in grade 7, which everybody has repeated three times. So that's why they are the best school. But still, I mean, working in this environment, it's still at least learning to read and write and do some maths is actually not bad. The, the boys' hostel doesn't look, doesn't look much better. So, uh, Okay, what have we done so far? We have started in 2012, we visited all the schools, we took down the necessary actions to get started, evaluated the infrastructure, all that. Uh, Telecom promised us to give internet access. Um, they have managed in two of the six schools since April 2012. And, you know, I mean, we have to talk to the PR manager, 
but the PR manager is not technical. So now the PR manager is quite a high figure in, 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 in Telecom Namibia, but he instructs the technicians, but nobody is following <laughs> Okay, next time we travel out to the village because we can't reach the teachers, we'll, we'll figure out there's still no internet. So we communicate to, with community members via SMS. So that's the agreement that they basically, they, they do go into the corner of their settlement where they have reception, send an SMS and rely on that they get a pretty much immediate response because we cannot initiate communication to them. Um, that's a bit tricky. So we had, oh sorry, we had outreach activities, um, but so far only in Epokiro and Ochinene and in the center for Barbas, uh, in the, the Renovo Technology Center, where we then invite teachers or head, head, headmasters from the schools. Um, so, so far six different Wikipedia related outreach activities. Um, and we had I mentioned that already in one of the talks we had the, uh, a group write, wanting to write in OGL or we had that established this week. That's how it works. Okay. You, you could see our activities as kind of grouped in phases. We didn't plan it like that. I didn't plan it like that. But now, retrospectively, that's what we did. Okay, first we start a set of right standard Wikipedia outreach. This is how you link. This is how you make it bold. Or italics. This is how you upload a picture. Uh, we had good attendance. Uh, on the day we left, there was no more edits, or one more edit, or two more, which were all reverted. So that was kind of. Uh, well, you see, it's not worth my time, uh, something like that. And it's maybe, maybe just generally the bad approach. Now, and then, we, and then I, it was my decision, I must admit. Then I went into the wrong direction further because I said, all right, there were three edits, they were reverted. Uh, maybe that was what put, uh, what put the one or two potential editors off. So I said, all right, let's now, if I go there again, uh, let's teach them more about the rules uh, of English Wikipedia. We started with English. So let's, let's try to get them on board why they were reverted and what happened there and how the community works and, and that stuff. Uh, at that training, there was already almost nobody attending, and only one of the people attending was actually one that was attending the first workshop. So that didn't work out either. I had to do another Wikipedia literacy training because I had new people. Um, so that was by far not well attended. And now, what happened? And now, uh, well, now we said, all right, what can we do? And then we said, all right, let's, let's skip that. All those people are not stupid. Uh, let's do something more about motivation and, and, and what drives them. So we had several. Actually, three motivational seminars. One, one very classic one, where, where just people, you know, where you have a speaker who, who, who gets you all on board and makes you all excited and this kind of stuff. And then we had uh, specifically to the issue, what would it make or what would it take to make you edit uh, in their own language? So I was only a guest. I was, I was only sitting on the side of the table and. Uh, at the side of the table, and whenever somebody had a technical question that would be translated to me, uh, for me, and I would answer. Uh, but all the rest was done exclusively in so the and uh, that had good attendance, that had somewhat good output, because we got a few clues uh, that we actually, okay, we didn't expect that, I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you in a moment, obviously. Um, but okay, it didn't lead to edits yet. We will have to see what this user group really means and whether, whether, they, whether they do what they actually promised or what they actually said they wanted to do. Uh, but I, I do think we have gained several relevant results there. And obviously we are now entering phase four where, uh, where we need to monitor. Did that work? Uh, what? What can we do to further improve it? So I cannot tell you of that one yet because phase four starts next week. But their first meeting and, and, and then we will then monitor what are they doing, are they having trouble, anything like that. 
Okay, so that is the outreach branch of the story, but we do have a research branch as well. Uh, that one is organized under the, under the name uh, Indigenous Knowledge Technologies. Uh, it's basically uh, using technology for the preservation of indigenous knowledge. That is a, a research cluster which is, which is um, active for over a decade already. We have, um, we have eight core scientists and four community designer, designers. We have several affiliated institutions from Europe, from, from UCT is one of the partners. Uh, so that's rather big, a litany of, of publications, obviously. Um, the aim is that technology is being co-designed so that it suits exactly the need of the indigenous, uh, of the indigenous knowledge preservation and the knowledge barriers. So we, we try to we try to avoid to run uh, of, uh, we try to avoid running in circles. Uh, it is to a certain degree inevitable because we are kind of navigating in an ocean that nobody nobody has surveyed yet, right? Uh, I don't think there's any any final solution of how we should do outreach. Uh, and, and, and what is exactly working, and I don't think anybody has solved the problem yet of introducing 100 people to Wikipedia editing and maybe getting 70 editors out of it. Maybe that's not even possible. Um, but, but we are discussing what our next steps are, what our aim is before we, before we go into any meeting with a teacher to avoid what I call blind activists, because I think that's not very helpful. Okay, what, what are factors preventing participation? I, I mentioned a few challenges on Friday. Uh, you can group them into cultural things, technical things, operational things, motivational things. Cultural things are very important because they are probably significant only in a small area and they might differ from country to country. For instance, for the, for the, for the Obabandero community, uh, Nobody is willing to put up an article because nobody is, wants to be seen as speaking on behalf of the community because they're not in that position, they're not the headman. Uh, they, they are in their ordinary life, they are not supposed to start a new issue or, or, or to, to speak on behalf of the entire community because that's not their role. And if they put up an article on Kobaris, for instance, then they feel that they take something away from their lead, what, what would be the right of their leaders. So the least thing that they want to do is they want to discuss it first. They want to have, they want to have an approved version before they even make the first word of it uh, visible to others. Uh, that's just how those communities work. And there's technical challenges, I'm not going to go through that again because that, that, might, not be, that might not be news for you. Then there's operational, uh, the way Wikipedia works. The, the set of rules on, on English Wikipedia is just overwhelming. You need, you need a year to learn that, probably more. And <coughs> as the organization is predominantly all, it also means the people are more happy to talk and listen than to write and read. That's just not what they, what they would normally do. Um, and then, of course, uh, I mentioned that already, uh, there's not really a, a general answer to the inevitable question of what's in for me. And, and the, sub, the results that I have seen, Yolanda told me there's more results, but what I have seen so far was pretty superficial and, and, and led to the answer, it's fine. Um, and, and that's not a good reason, I mean, if I tell a teacher it's fun, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to invite it anymore because learning and teaching has to be hard. It has to be hard work, otherwise it's not proper learning. Uh, that goes through all sections of education in Namibia. They do expect school to be hard work, both for the teachers, both for the learners. As soon as it becomes fun, they, they think that's not related to education. Okay. What 
are we considering? We are considering persuasive computing, giving giving immediate feedback, running competitions by means by technical means through SMSs, through through emails, on the Wikipedia talk pages. It's, we'll, we'll start that next week, so you can you can watch us. We have a we have a specialist on persuasive computing uh, who's who's doing that for us for the first time. Um, I call it deep bushing. Um, we, we want to, we decided to bypass the English Wikipedia for now because teaching those thousand words doesn't really work. We said, all right, let's go to the OJR railway incubator. Let's try it there. At least I don't need to spend weeks and weeks explaining how it works. And there I 